Thank you. And uh, let me first thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here today and uh, the whole uh, month that I'm spending here, and which is very nice. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about the stability of the Kuwait flow. And uh, first of all, I should introduce the uh, Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, so the equation is as follows. Uh, where nu is a positive coefficient, which is called the uh, viscosity. <coughs> and if nu equals 0, the equation is called uh, Euler equation. Uh, and there is a divergence-free condition. The divergence of u is 0. OK, so u is valued in R3. And it's a function of t, x, y, and z. Uh, x is in the torus t. y is in the real space. And uh, z is also on the torus. Um, so I agree there is a few fluids that uh, live in such a geometry. <laughs> Nevertheless, it has the advantage of um, getting rid of boundaries. So what I want to discuss today is uh, the stability of shear flows. And uh, so it's already a complicated question. And if you add boundaries, it adds a number of, of difficulties, uh, which I, I don't want to consider today. <coughs> So this particular geometry allows one to have shear flows without boundaries. So what is a shear flow? A shear flow is a flow of the type, say, f of y, 0, 0. Um, and the particular flow that I want to look at is the Kuwait flow, where f is a just a linear function. So you have y, 0, 0. This is the Kuwait flow. And this is a solution of Navier-Stokes for any new positive. <coughs> okay. So the stability of shear flows in general is a, is a difficult question. And uh, what we discuss today is the stability of this uh, particular shear flow, which is simpler for, for reasons that we will see. So maybe I should draw a picture. So this is y, this is x, and this is z. And so the velocity of the fluid at the point on the uh, y-axis goes like that. So you see there is a, a linear shear. Uh, so I, I hope you get a, a sense for the geometry that we are looking at. Uh, so the question that we want to understand is the stability of this flow, which is a stationary solution of Navier-Stokes, and maybe even the asymptotic stability. It does not have finite energy. It does not have finite energy. Um, OK, so w what can we say about stability? Uh, so the first point is that you need to take a positive uh, viscosity coefficient. Otherwise, you pretty much have uh, no chance. OK, so nu has to be positive. So the next thing you do is try and look at the linearized problem. So informally speaking, you just drop the uh, convection term. And what you keep essentially is the, the heat equation. So it's a bit more complicated because you need to linearize around the, the Kuwait flow. But essentially, you get a, a linear heat equation with some more complicated terms, which are lower order. 
But what you see immediately is that the linearized problem is stable. And it's even very stable in that you get a spectral gap. Uh, so once you have such a, a strong uh, spectral information, it's not hard to deduce uh, nonlinear stability. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, uh, spectrum depends on the space. And we have an infinite energy flow, so now we need a That's true. finite energy perturbation. And just L2, is that what you want? Uh, yeah, so let me remain a little bit informal uh, at, at this point. But say, yeah, in L2, for instance. Um, okay, uh, however, there is uh, something which in hydrodynamic stability is known as the Sommerfeld paradox. So it's, it's, it's true for the quet flow and for many other uh, shear flows. So what happens is that the flow is uh, linearly stable, as we saw, but uh, experimentally unstable. <coughs> okay. So it's called the Sommerfeld paradox. So linear stability, uh, but experimental instability. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so of course, uh, it's, it's not really a paradox. Uh, really what it underlines is that uh, the, the important notion is not so much nonlinear stability, as the size of the basin of attraction of the quet flow. Okay, so if you want the resolution of the paradox is uh, just saying that the important uh, idea, say, is to uh, sort of quantify uh, nonlinear stability in finding the size of the basin of attraction. Um, and uh, this was already uh, underlined by Kelvin. Uh, and finally, there is a last idea which maybe we're not so used to in um, partial differential equations, which is that the, the size of the basin of attraction really depends strongly on the topology that you choose. And this idea goes back to Reynolds, though he phrased it in more uh, physical terms. So uh, if you put all of this together, you see that the right question is the following. Uh, so maybe let me call, um, let me change notations a little bit. Let me now call u not the perturbation of the quet flow. initial perturbation of the quet flow, and u uh, to be the perturbation of the quet flow at later times. As it is given by just solving the Navier-Stokes equation for later times. So I hope I convinced you that the right question is the following. Uh, if you give me, say, a, a Banner space X with a norm um, associated to it, uh, then what you want to find is what is the smallest real number gamma uh, such that if the initial perturbation is uh, less than uh, nu to the gamma, so remember nu is uh, the size of the viscosity, and the more viscosity you add, the more stable the flow. Um, so it, it, it makes sense that the dependence is, is like that. So then you might ask, why should the dependence be power-like? Uh, well, it's, it's simply what experience uh, teaches us. So what you want is that if the uh, numerics uh, theory 
it, it, it all gives this sort of dependence. It's a small new. Small, small new, yes. Um, this implies first that u of t in x remains small, and second, that u goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay. So, in other words, what we're asking is to really quantify the size of the basin of attraction of Quet. Uh, and what we're asking for is uh, asymptotic stability if you're suffi sufficiently close to, uh, uh, to Quet initially. Okay. Uh, so there has been a lot of work on, on this question. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to mention a few, a few names. The, the previous results on stability were also yeah. asymptotic stability, right? Um, yes, that's right. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, of course, you could ask, you know, you could ask uh, for uh, that, that you remain close to Quaid for a large time, but I don't think this has been too much uh, looked at. Um, Right, so there has been a lot of uh, heuristic or uh, numerical works uh, so okay, let me just mention a few names. Uh, there is Baggett, Driscoll and uh, Trefethen. There is Baggett and Trefethen. Uh, there is uh, Valef, there is Chapman, okay, and many other. And, uh, well, they actually don't really agree. Uh, they find that gamma lies between one and uh, seven quarters, depending who, who you believe. Okay, so that's uh, one set of work where uh, the authors did not really care about the importance of the topology, right? So they just considered perturbations without really mentioning what sort of perturbations. Uh, and then there is another work by uh, Reddy, Schmidt, <coughs> Baggett, Henningsen, uh, where the authors find gamma equals three half for what they call uh, rough perturbations. Okay, meaning you perturb a uh, quet by something which is like white noise, whereas here they were more perturbing by Gaussian, say. Um, okay, and there is also rigorous results. Uh, so it started with uh, Romanov, who looked at the case of a, a channel rather than the whole space. Um, and then there is uh, Kreis, Lundblad, Henningsen. Okay, and once again, there is many references. I don't cite everybody. Uh, but the, the world record was gamma less or equal than 4 by rigorous means uh, in dimension 3. So everything is in dimension 3. And in uh, Sobolev topology. Okay, so that, that was the state of the art. Um, now let me describe uh, our results. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, so maybe let me first, uh, let me start by talking about the 3D case. Uh, and then I'm gonna say a word about what happens in 2D. So in the 3D case, uh, there is, uh, two topologies that you can consider, uh, either uh, Gevre topology or uh, Sobolev uh, topology. Uh, so in uh, Gevre topology, uh, we found gamma equals one, and in uh, Sobolev topology, we found gamma less than or equal to three halves. So this is a joint work with uh, uh, Jacob Bedrosian. Uh, who's in Maryland and uh, Nader Masmoudi uh, who's at NYU. 
so what's very nice is that it settles the debate, right? We have theorems which actually say that in Gervre topology, gamma is 1, and in Sobolev, gamma is less than or equal to 3 halves. We are furthermore able to say that this result is optimal, and uh, that's why I, I uh, stated it as gamma equals 1. This one, we uh, suspect it is optimal because it agrees very much with uh, what these guys found for rough data, and Sobolev topology is certainly rougher than Chevrolet. So we suspect it is optimal, but we could not really uh, prove it. Yeah, do you gain anything from analyticity? Yes. Oh, you mean if you go further to analytic? Uh, no, no, you, you would uh, keep the same, uh, the same exponent. So um, maybe let's... It doesn't let depend on the, on the Gevray exponent. Yes. So here what I mean by Gevray is, uh, say, e to the d to the one-half plus f in L2. Uh, and what I mean by sub f is d to the five, uh, sorry, it should be u naught, five-half plus u naught uh, in L2. Uh, OK, so that's, that's uh, what we did with uh, Jacob and Nader. Uh, but there is also uh, results on the 2D case, so which really give a, a full picture. So uh, in uh, Jevray uh, topology, uh, so this is where uh, everything started. Uh, you find gamma equals zero, and this is due to uh, Bedrosian and uh, Masmoudi. So that's for the case nu equals zero. And then it was extended by Bedrosian, Masmoudi, and Vicol to the case of uh, positive viscosity. And recently, uh, the case of Sobolev in 2D has been treated. Uh, here you find gamma less than or equal to a half. And this is due to um, Bedrosian. Vicol and Wang. OK, so it's, it's really nice because uh, for this particular flow, it's possible to get a pretty complete picture of what happens in terms of stability. And uh, there is this, this nice feature that you have a, a dependence on the, I mean, this interesting feature that uh, it's dependent on the topology, which uh, maybe is, is not so common in, uh, in PDE. But what about other exponents, solar exponents? It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you go instead of right. half, you use a, a million. Uh, yeah, yeah. So a anything above five halves, we, we, we believe, should give three halves. And then if you go to very low regularity, um, then maybe something else happens, right? if you go to very low. But, uh, oh, and sorry, my mistake. I think I, I said five halves, but it should be nine halves. And does that right, it should be nine halves. change when you change dimension? Uh, so this is dimension 3, right? This is dimension 3. And in 2D, uh, the Gevray exponent remains the same, and the Sobolev exponent is uh, 3 halves, I think, if Vlad is here. 3 halves, I think. Yeah. Uh, OK, so that's, that's uh, uh, the result. Uh, so now I'm going to explain uh, w what the picture is in, in 3D. Um, so, right, so the first thing to do is to consider the perturbed equation around quet. When you say u of t is uh, smaller than 1, mm -hmm. what do you want? Ah, okay, so you want to avoid something like, uh, you know, um, pretty much since you have viscosity, it, 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 it's possible that maybe u starts very close to quet, does a lot of completely insane things, and comes back to quet, right? So this we don't count as a stability, right? We count it as stability if you remain always very close to, to quet. You see what I mean? It strikes me these are these ideas of trefethen of a non self adjoint flows where they're large transients. Oh yeah, so I'm going to explain that. It, it's indeed 
this, the fact that the linearized problem is uh, not self-adjoint, uh, that gives transient growth, and which is ultimately, I think, responsible for this difference depending on the topology you consider. So I, I'm going to try and explain that. Okay, so uh, the perturbed equation. Um, so, as I was saying, we consider a solution of uh, Navier-Stokes of the form quet, that is y0, 0, 0, plus u. So now u is the uh, perturbation of uh, Navier-Stokes. Okay, so if you do a small computation, you realize that u solves this equation. Um, Okay, and so this 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 part is is not uh, self-adjoint, um, and of course uh, the divergence of u is is still zero. Okay, so uh, uh, it it turns out that it's a good idea to try and remove this uh, convection term, and this can be done easily by changing uh, the uh, independent variables though it comes to the expense of modifying the differential operators. So let's do that. Uh, so if you, s to remove uh, y dx u, uh, what you do is you set capital X equals X minus T y, capital Y equals Y, capital Z equals Z, and you rewrite the equation in these uh, new uh, variables it has the effect of turning gradient into what we call grad L, which is uh, dy <coughs> minus t dx, dx dz, and Laplacian into uh, Laplacian L, which is grad L squared. Okay, so in this new coordinates, uh, let me call also capital U of t, capital X, uh, equals little u of t x y z. So in this new coordinates, the equation reads uh, ouch. Okay, so pretty much we just remove the y dx u uh, and now the differential operators have this more uh, complicated uh, structure. Okay, uh, so if you look at the linearized problem, maybe it's best to view it in these new coordinates. Well, it's pretty clear. Get DTU minus mu Laplacian LU. and the pressure term, right. So you can express the pressure term as two grad L, Laplacian L inverse dx u2. Okay, so that's the linearized problem and uh, that's the full uh, nonlinear equation. Uh, so what I'm gonna try and explain in the time that remains is a few, um, uh, striking properties of this uh, linearized uh, problem, which has a lot of uh, very, uh, you know, striking features. Uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm going to mention a, a few uh, important uh, features of, of the, of the nonlinear <coughs> problem. Okay, so the first uh, 
linear uh, heuristic is the so-called uh, lift-up effect. So that's the name that uh, uh, this thing is called in the physics literature. So this is the the main uh, destabilizing effect in dimension three, and it is absent in dimension two. So this explains why the exponents in dimension three are less good than in dimension two, at least partially. Uh, okay, so how does it work? Well, uh, a very important idea is that the frequencies which are zero in uh, capital X behave, or little x, behave very differently from the frequencies which are not zero in uh, little x. And this is because of this uh, shear here. Uh, so the, if you look at the linearized problem, the shear will only affect the non-zero frequencies in x. So the picture is very different depending on whether you look at zero frequencies or non-zero frequencies in x. So here, uh, we look at zero frequencies in x, and we call f uh, sub naught uh, the integral of f dx, which is the same as the integral of uh, capital F d capital X, but it, it doesn't matter. It's just the uh, zero frequencies in the x uh, variable. So it turns out the linearized problem is extremely simple for zero frequencies. Uh, because then the uh, dx u2 cancels, so the right hand side cancels, and the delta L uh, becomes a regular delta. So the only thing that remains is dtu minus nu Laplace and u. So I put a zero to indicate that it's the zero frequency in x plus u2 zero zero equals zero. So that's very simple, and you can actually explicitly solve, and you find that u naught is, uh, so the first coordinate is e nu t Laplacian, u1, so here I put in for initial to distinguish from the zero, which is the zero frequency, minus t u2 initial, E nu t Laplacian u2 initial, uh, initial zero, right? Everything is at zero frequency. E nu t Laplacian u3 initial at time zero. Uh, so obviously the second and third coordinates are well behaved. Uh, but this one, you see, it grows linearly until the uh, heat kernel kicks in but this happens only at a time t like 1 over nu. Okay? So this gives linear growth until t like 1 over nu. Um, and you see in dimension 2, uh, this does not occur because u2 uh, 0 has to be 0 due to the divergence-free condition. Uh, so that's the main source of instability, and it's really a, a 3D effect. Uh, okay, so the second piece of uh, linear heuristics that I want to present is the so-called enhanced dissipation. Okay, so let me try and explain the idea in, in physical terms. So if you look at this picture, um, you see, if you have a good physical intuition, that uh, if you have something that depends on x due to the transport in this direction, so this direction is like a torus direction, right? Uh, if you have 
uh, data that actually does depend on x. Uh, this leads to the creation of very high frequencies, very fast. And these get then uh, eaten up by the uh, viscosity or by the heat equation. Okay. So uh, maybe it's easier to see it uh, through the equations. So it's actually very easy. Uh, if we just look at the heat equation in the new coordinates. Okay, so that's the heat equation in the new coordinates. And let's just forget about the rest of the, of the linearized problem. Let's just keep this piece. And remember that delta L, it's dx squared plus dy minus tdx squared plus dz squared. Uh, so if t becomes very big, of course what matters is this guy here, t dx. So essentially what remains is dtf minus nu t uh, squared dx squared f. Okay, something like that. That's say the leading part if t goes to infinity equals zero. So you see that the uh, viscosity becomes uh, immense as t goes to infinity. And if you switch to a Fourier variable, this becomes dtf hat minus nu t squared k squared f hat equals zero. And it's easy to solve. f hat of t k is something like e minus nu t cubed k squared f hat initial. So here you have a t cubed instead of a t. Okay, so it, it makes a huge difference and it means viscosity acts extremely fast uh, once you have the shear. And so what it means is that the uh, dissipative time scale is now 1 over nu to the 1 third, right? Instead of 1 over nu for regular uh, heat equations. Okay, so I, I should say this uh, sort of uh, idea has been exploited first by uh, Bedrosian, Masmoudi, and Vicol. Okay, and then there is the last uh, linear effect, which is the uh, famous uh, inviscid damping, which is the Euler version of uh, Landau damping. So linear heuristic three. Uh, inviscid damping, which is the once again the Euler version of Landau damping. And of course, this uh, phenomenon received a lot of attention after the work of uh, Mouo and Villani on uh, Landau damping for Vlasov Poisson. Uh, so it's actually very easy to, to see in this context. There is just a little trick, and the little trick is to switch to the new variable Q2, which is Laplacian L U2. Okay. So it, it looks a bit magic, but it's the standard change of variable that uh, physicists do, for instance. And what's very nice is that in this new variable, uh, the, the equation satisfied by Q2 is dt q2 minus nu Laplacian l q2 equals zero. So that's at the uh, linearized level. Sorry? The other variables are kept the same, u1, u2. Uh, right, so the other variables don't behave that simply. So I, that's why I just single out uh, this one. <coughs> so, for simplicity, if we just look at the case uh, nu equals zero, so which is really the inviscid case, so the Euler case, 
what happens is that Q2 is constant, right? Because you just get dt Q2 equal, and that's at the linearized level, yeah. So it's very simple to uh, recover U2. U2 is simply 1 over Laplace and L Q2. So now if I take uh, the Fourier transform and switch from XYZ by Fourier to K eta L, uh, you see what comes out is U2 hat equals 1 over K squared. Now given the definition of uh, Laplace and L, eta minus kt squared plus l squared times u2 initial hat. And this formula is extremely instructive because from this formula you can read two things. First, what happens as t goes to infinity? So as t goes to infinity, this guy becomes huge so that u2 hat goes to zero, and then u2 goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So this is why it's called inviscid damping. So for u equals zero, you have a very nice Hamiltonian system, no dissipative effect whatsoever. Nevertheless, uh, you get this decay of u2 as t goes to infinity. And I should say it's not an effect uh, which is like scattering for, uh, say, wave equations in, in the whole space because um, you, you don't have space to scatter in the x direction. Um, okay, uh, so that's sort of the, the good side of the picture. But on the other hand, if uh, <coughs> this factor here vanishes, t equals eta over k, so it means this factor here vanishes, and then uh, you get a, a growth compared to uh, what happens at time zero. Okay, so there is this two-sided effect. Uh, this one is called uh, inviscid damping. And this is rather helping us uh, to prove uh, stability. And this one is called the OR mechanism. And of course, it's rather annoying because it means that uh, you have growth uh, at various moments in, in time. And of course, the fact that you have this growth at various moments in time is ultimately uh, linked to the non self adjoint character of the uh, <coughs> linearized operator, right? Since it's non self adjoint, it's well known that uh, you should expect growth for the evolution problem. Uh, okay, so that's the. You, you can call it intermittency, right? Because if you look at that, it's sort of very nice all the time, but there is uh, one particular moment where it grows and then it decays again. So one might call that intermittency. Okay. Uh, so now let me discuss the nonlinear problem. So, nonlinear heuristics one, it's the so called uh, streak solutions. Uh, so, I should call the, uh, I should write again the nonlinear the nonlinear problem, this time in the original variables. <laughs> and an important observation is that uh, there is a, a, a large set of explicit solutions to this problem, which consist of uh, u2 depending only on y and z and u3 depending only on y and z as well, uh, just solving the 2D Navier-Stokes equation, while u1 is driven, so if you plug that in, you see that it works, and that u1 is simply driven 
uh, by u2 and u3 in the following way. Oh, I forgot someone here. There is minus u2, 0, 0. So here you get uh, u1, so u2 d, u2 dy plus u3 dz, u1 equals minus u2. Okay, so u1 is just a uh, slave to the others, and these two solve the 2D Navier-Stokes. So that's an exact uh, set of solutions. And you see, uh, so these are called streak solutions because supposedly they look like streaks in experiments. Uh, and you see they play the role of an attractor because what the enhanced dissipation does is that very fast it's killing any dependence on x. Right, so here to get uh, this very uh, fast decay, you need that k be non-zero. I should have said that. So if k is non-zero, uh, you get very fast damping. What remains does not depend on x. And uh, these are streaks. Okay, so these are attractors, at least on the time scale, uh, one over nu to the one third. Okay, and the uh, last thing that I would like to emphasize is the various null forms which are found in this equation. Uh, so, okay, so there is it's there is a lot, but let me just mention two. Uh, if you look at the most uh, threatening interactions, well, first, the most threatening interaction is due to the growth of u1 up there. You see that u1 is growing linearly. So really, the worst that could happen is u1, uh, and it's at zero frequency, talking to u1 at zero frequency maybe with derivatives. Um, so this would be very bad uh, because both grow linearly, so it would uh, completely uh, kill the structure. Unfortunately, this does not happen. There is no such interaction. Another uh, problematic term is the, the grad L. So if you remember, grad, uh, u dot grad L. It's u1 dx plus u2, I'm uh, sorry, I should put capital U, dy minus tdx plus u3 dz. Uh, and so, of course, this t here is uh, very uh, threatening, but luckily it comes paired with u2, and we saw that U2 uh, decays <coughs> thanks to inviscid damping. So there is sort of a cancellation between this T factor here and the U2 which uh, decays. Okay. Uh, so uh, the proof consists in putting all of this together. So essentially the picture that emerges is that um, First, on a time scale 1 over nu to the 1 third, you get this uh, enhanced dissipation, which kills all uh, non-zero x modes. Okay. Then uh, the solution looks like a streak um, for t larger than 1 over nu to the 1 third, like a streak plus something very small. Uh, and then what happens is the lift-up effect uh, kicks in, and you get growth until you reach time 1 over nu. Okay. And then you pray that you can keep everybody under control and you can do it thanks to these uh, cancellations which uh, are present in the equation. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.
and crescent. So in this mechanism we describe the end. Where does the inter this intermittency come in? Mm -hmm. oh, and it must there must be a big end there, right? Oh yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a big worry. Yeah, yeah. So you need to so that's for this reason that um, Bedrosian and Masmoudi introduced their toy model in 2D. And in 2D, that's really the main problem uh, because they're able to do the case nu equals zero. In 3D, uh, it's not, I mean, it's one of the problems, but it's not the only one anymore. Yes? So you didn't quite explain the connection between the proof and the fact that you have this difference between, uh, between topologies. All right. Yeah. So, okay. So, wha what this uh, OR mechanism is doing is that, so if, say, uh, if you think of eta uh, being big, so you look at high frequencies. No, sorry. We think of uh, eta being uh, small. Which one do we think? Otherwise, it makes no difference. It's your poetry. Um... Right, so what you want to avoid is a high to low cascade, right? So that's what OR mechanism uh, could do. And uh, the best way to avoid a high to low cascade is just to start with very few high frequencies. And, and that's why um, it helps. So that's, that's how it's related. So it's the, that mechanism that at the end of the day tells you what the theorem is. It's, it's at the end of the day, the yeah. uh, Javre classes to do that. So this is a I mean, in, in 2D, yes. In 2D, it's very clear. In 3D, uh, things are messier, and it's not the only effect that one has to take into account. In particular, the lift-up effect is, is, is m m more threatening. And, and it's, yeah, maybe it's, it's more the lift-up effect in 3D, which is annoying. So is there a simple heuristic explanation of the number 3 over 2? Mm, no, no. Uh, for for uh, uh, the in in Gevray topology, the one over new scale, it's easy to explain. Right, and that's lift up effect, right? That gives you your yes, own. exactly. Uh -huh. But how do you yeah. get three halves? Where does it so happen? three halves, it's less clear. There is no simple uh, like I cannot point to a single mechanism that that does it. All right, no two mechanisms together. Oh, or not even. <laughs> but why do you think it's it's uh, optimal? Uh, right, w we think it's optimal <laughs> because we tried hard to do better and the numerics give the same. That's <laughs> I agree, it's, uh, you know...